Good morning, this is Thorsten. I'm German and I've occupied the Institute for Advanced Humanistic Studies at Peking University. This is the heart of uh, Confucianism in China, and I'll explain that in a minute. It's a pretty nice room, and this is, this is my little office. We have to bring our own laptops to work. That's very normal in China. The bosses try to s save money for the business trips. It's actually here where I wrote the essays on Shenzhen and language imperialism and the end of translation, the coming of post-translational society, which are, I think, very influential. So this is where I, where I sleep. So I have the privilege to have it zero minutes to work every day. This place is simply amazing. There's a door, we go there in a minute. It's a little corner for conference. You see all these other places, they're supposed to be for researchers and uh, postdocs and docs, but they never come. Um, I mean, why would they? There's no payment here, they're not paid. Low people don't get paid in China at all, as you know. They work because it's an honor for them to work for Peking University or for places and like this or high professors. It's a privilege for them and they don't need much money. So let's go out here. You see some cleaning people. It's cleaned every day, although there's no people here. And they never are here, actually. There's some office stuff during the week. They will come, party officials, secretaries, but not the professors. They only come here to take the money, and then they leave, because they are Employed elsewhere as well. This is very common in China too. It's a little kitchen, by the way. Very lovely. In China, it's very common to have uh, different positions at different universities, for example, and you only show up to get your little salary and then you disappear again. And they also employ their family members, as you know. This is very common in Chinese society. There's a second floor, actually. And we would love actually to use the facilities, but we cannot. It's empty as well. It's a World Heritage Institute. And um, there are never any people here. But you know, as long as the money flows, someone got paid for this, so they can't take it down, can't close it or move it. So in the back, we have a nice here we call it WC, and it's always clean. I, you see, the cleaning ladies. And there's a little library here with the question of our director. No one else's book can be here, and it's, it's closed actually. And there's a door to the backyard, which I could use now, but... I don't need because I have the main key. So let's go quickly back. So these are the guards. They are not our institute, but they are from Beda. And there's coming an office lady. Yeah, so. Mm. Okay, it has rained, but look at this. It looks like an enchanted forest, isn't it? We are in the middle of Peking University, and it has some of the most beautiful sceneries in any universities, I think. And that over there in the back, yeah, background this is a boyata. This is a symbol of Peking University and you will see it on any postcards. 
any reports. And this here is the house I just left. It's the Institute for Advanced Humanistic Studies of Peking University. The very heart of Confucianism at this moment, of academic Confucianism anyway. If we go just a few meters, I will show you the famous lake without a name. It is very close by. And let me use the time to explain to you some key concept of Chinese Confucianism. Confucianism is not the Chinese name. It's a name given by the European missionaries when they discovered China, so to speak. They were looking for a Messiah figure like Jesus Christ was for Christianity and they found it in Kungze. So naturally for them they named Kungze's religion Confucianism. But in China Confucianism is called Ruja. So names are important, aren't they? If you get the translation wrong they will mislead and distort the re reality. The Chinese belief in a relationship between man and man, the man and his family, and to the superiors, and then to society at large, and to the country, and of course to the universe at, at whole. And it's very pragmatic society. They don't have any God in that equation, which is nice for change. You see, this is the beginning of Wei Minghu. This is a little pond. They have goldfish here and quite a few turtles. It's beautiful, isn't it? And it's very spiritual. Peking University is a mother lord of Chinese education. So the Chinese who make it in here they have sweated a lot in school and they're usually the best only one person out of each school can attend universities like this like Beida or the Tsinghua University which is across the street basically there are 168 universities in this district Haidian in the northwest of Beijing okay back to Confucianism they believe that Confucianism promotes Jinze. Jinze is a kind of superior personality. And um, it's close to becoming a Shengren, a sage, but of course that's quite unattainable. So we have to put up with the Jinze. The Jinze is a moral man. He is higher morals, higher standard, higher education. He's a kind person, he's Shanliang. He talks to everyone, it's a dialogical uh, civilization. And he cares for the people. He treats them as if they were a family. So this is the Wei Minghu, the famous one. This campus is huge, so you actually haven't seen any buildings so far. A lot of very famous people, thinkers, philosophers, statesmen walked here around the lake. Mao Zedong, Hu Shi, Ji Xianlin. The Jinze is also a man who can live in relative poverty. That explains a lot. Uh, in Chinese academia, people are not paid very well. This is an open, this open secret. I say that the, the academics, like most public employees in China, if you think about it, earn at most 30 to 40 percent of the money they would need to uh, 
fulfill their duty to have a decent lifestyle and to raise a family and all that. So the rest of the money they need they have to earn uh, through various means and through hidden perks and they're very good at it.